how do people who have Ebola come or present to a health facility? You as a physician or people in the community, what do we see? So once somebody has come in contact with somebody with Ebola, it takes about two to 21 days for them to develop the symptoms. This is what we call incubation period. The time between you are infected and the time when you start showing signs and symptoms or illnesses or being showing that you are not well. The disease may show up on different severity. You may be what we call asymptomatic. People who don't show any signs and symptoms as they are infected. You may have mild disease. Those who come and say have a fever, a flu, and headache. Some come with moderate disease when they are unwell, vomiting, uh, unable to stand up, have difficulty in breathing, dehydrated. Then we have severe disease where people come and are in shock, uh, one was in coma, bleeding from different parts of the, the, the body and with signs of organ failure. As I said, this is a very contagious disease. One patient can transmit from one person to another during the course of the disease. When we do examine these people, we are able to tell the severity of the disease depending on what signs and symptoms we see. In the clinic, we are, have what we call clinical features. Clinical features is what the doctor can examine and know. But when we say you have clinical features, meaning you are able to show signs and symptoms that you are sick. The common ones are in red. If you can have access to your screen, we see that you people will have headache, which is number three, muscle pain, that's very common, abdominal pain, which is mainly epigastric. Epigastric is the central point in your chest, where the stomach starts, that's epigastric pain. We have diarrhea, which can be watery or bloody. Then we have conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is the redness of eyes. That is the easiest way to, to make it easier. But there are also other symptoms, fatigue, weakness, um, arthralgia, which is joint pains, loss of appetite, vomiting, throat pain, and difficulty in swallowing. Now, this is what we see at the early state of the disease. So when we say we've taken people for isolation, we are contact. We are looking out for any of these clinical features I have just mentioned. However, late in the treatment and when people are presenting late, this is what we expect to see. We can see diarrhea, which is profuse, which is either watery, but it's so loose, and it may be blood stained or bloody. We see vomiting, which can be watery or with blood. Then people become confused and very irritable. They can be in shock. That means they are so dehydrated, hypodermic. They can be bleeding. They have a body rash, skin rash. They can have scissors, which is the same as seeing convulsion. They may have chest pain. When women are pregnant, they are likely to abort, which we call a miscarriage. Some people have difficulties with breathing, which we call respiratory distress, not so often, and then hiccups, cascoda. How is the disease transmitted? So uh, these are the places through which, and some of them you can look out for. Touching blood, blood is a source of infection. Uh, Two percent of urine samples, or five percent of sample samples, may have a virus. One of the common thing is sweat. People usually get a fever, and they're able to sweat. So touching that sweat will cause them to show the signs of infection and will get infected. What you see there as a red and white tube coming out, that is a placenta. People don't ever see the placenta is that part which feeds us when we're still in our mother's womb. So this. When you have products of conception, which is the placenta and anything from the uterus, breast milk, semen, and I think you know what semen is, contains viable virus. That means they are infectious. And for semen, it can remain uh, positive or infectious and can be recovered after long when people have healed. In fact, when we discharge people from the treatment center, the advice is that they have to protect to practice safe sex.
uh, meaning if you're a man, you're supposed to use a condom for a prolonged time, close to seven to nine months. And there is some study. So we will advise people who are young. The things and equipment we use in the hospital can also carry uh, the infection on them. So we must have key ways in which we, we handle uh, infection control. We need to do screening. And what we screen for, you've seen people being screened for temperature, so that if we can detect anybody in the temperature above 38, then we are able to separate them from the rest and start asking them about other health needs. And then we have to triage. Triage is meaning you are separating carefully as people walk into the health facility. They come in with different signs and symptoms. We don't want to put everybody in one sitting area, you can cause an infection within the hospital or the triaging areas. Why we do this is to try to help us identify any potential people who may be sick and separate them from the rest and also channel them properly. However, for us to be able to do that, we need to continue carrying out our routine measures that presupposes that all patients or clients and their products, e.g. blood and fluids, may contain infection. Therefore, we must put on our full protective gears or make sure we are doing standard infection prevention and control by putting on gloves, having a high level of suspicion, not mixing up patients, and going to places where you are sure you'll be handled in a clean place. Now, with Ebola, I must caution, whereas people are, will go first to the private sector and in Uganda we've seen they have gone to witch doctors and Cassandra because they are confused of what is happening. The first people will be infected the health workers before an epidemic is widely done as to where it is spreading. So for us to make sure we stop the transmission, we still have to use the infection prevention controls, uh, have precautions where the pathogen is highly infectious. Uh, we need to separate our wastes. I think I was muted in my back. Hello. I need some feedback from you to know whether you can still hear me. Oh. Hello. Yes, Hello. We can hear you. The voice has raised a bit, doctor. The volume was very low. Mm. Oh, please. The volume was very me. low, but now it's it's raising a bit. Okay. Is that any better? Please forgive me. I, I, I wasn't. We're uh, much out. better. We're much. Okay. I apologize. Uh, I'm going to speak at this level going forward. I was saying that we need to stop transmission by isolating people or putting them in places based on their contact and risk ability. That's why you hear that once there is a person who has had contact in a family, we try to take them away from the rest of the population and take them to quarantine sites. And if you are alone in the home, then we can keep you in a home and advise you not to move away. However, when we do this, we've found that people do not actually uh, uh, obey or, com or comply with the regulations and it, it forces us to do other things that are not the preferred way of handling initial people. We all know the modes of transmission of this disease is through three types of droplets, contacts, droplets, and airborne uh, aerosols. So we make sure we do not come in contact with people's blood, saliva, or body fluids on our soft places. And the soft places are, I think I have, okay. The soft places are the mouth, nose, ears, uh, 
and all openings in the body and uh, private parts. Administering measures to facilitate implementation of standard and make sure there's no transmission. We need to have security where we are. We need to wash our hands. We need to make sure people don't move away from the isolation places uh, to the general places where they can transfer infection. This graph here shows you the standard precautions that we need to take. The moment we know we are handling infectious material or it's been an infection, the key one is standard hand hygiene. High hand hygiene means you are sanitizing your hands all the time, you are washing them. If you are touching any uh, contaminated materials, you have your full PPE and also changing and removing gloves so often. Uh, use of PPE, which is personal protective equipment, is based on risk assessment. You cannot put on the full PPE as if you are in a treatment center when you are just waiting for people at the gate uh, because the risks are different. We also want to encourage people to use, to safely use and dispose of all shops, needles, and all that. We want the waste management or the linen or the cotton or the lab tests must be decontaminated for being disposed of. All the water runoff cannot be allowed to go in the common sewer or lines because those can cause a source of infection where there is uh, children starting with water. Um, We also want to encourage people to have a septic non touch. I think I'm going to take off the microphone and see whether I become harder, louder. Um, let me know if you hear me. I have stopped using the earpieces, and if that makes the yeah. sound better, I got uh, here that it's on. I was still low. Much better, Doctor. Helen, any feedback? Am I any louder? Yes, you are much, much better now. Much oh. better. Oh, Maya. Yes, okay. please. So we have to keep the environment clean, which we call environmental cleaning. Then appropriate handling of linen. Linen is our bed sheets, our clothes, and everything we touch. And then we also have respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. Remember, during the COVID outbreak, we said you bend your, you bend your elbow and cough into your clothes. That holds the the aerosols that would have continued to move into the space around you. So some key tips for precaution, and I'm just repeating this, hand hygiene, use alcohol-based soap and rub water and make sure water is available in all your working spaces. Water and soap can adequately manage the infection as part of infection control, if it is used all the time and rightly. I was speaking to people and I say, even if you're handling money, you can be able to use a hand sanitizer and in between don't touch your eyes or other parts before you clean your hands. Well, um, in terms of using personal protective gear, you can see the picture there. People get dressed up fully. That's what we want you to be dressed in if you're working or touching a hospital patient or client where you suspect Ebola. To put on this, it bets best on the risk. Are you in contact with people who have been definitely isolated before or where we suspect infection has occurred? In terms of environmental hygiene, I showed you the correct use of disinfectants. We mix JIC to 5%, that is one per five portion per hundred uh, mixing solvent. So JIC is inactivated. JIC is inactivated by organic matter. So cleaning surfaces before use. JIC is not stable beyond 24 hours and it's degraded by light. Therefore, you need to prepare it as fresh every day. So people need to know how to make their own disinfectant. And then when we are disposing of waste, we must segregate it. Some is soil, some is highly infectious. So in the setting where we put off waste, especially in terms of uh, care setting. We talked about the self-disposal of shops and also the equipment we use in the health facilities, the thermometers, we prefer non-touch guns, 
and not having put our face scope on every single chest. I now want to switch and begin to let you know what has been happening in the country. As of 31st, today is 2nd, I saw I'm a, a day or two late. Uh, there are a few numbers which I've added to this one so far. When you see the number of districts currently confirmed with cases, Mubende, Kasanga, Chegwekwa, Bunyangabo, Kagadi, Wachiso, and Kampala. So all these districts, there is an opportunity that the disease can be spread from one person to another. You remember, we have 36, 136 districts in Uganda. So seven of our districts are currently in high alert. Kampala and all the districts in between Kampala and the epicenter in uh, Kassanda and Mubende remain high risk districts. So we have 130 confirmed cases. By yesterday, there was one new case. Uh, yesterday, we had, on, I mean, two days ago, we had six people who died and cumulatively bringing the deaths to 43. So 43 families are mourning the loss of their loved ones. That is a grave number. It's not just a matter of saying these are numbers. These are real families who are grieving. However, we do have some people who have recovered. Yesterday, the other day, there were two people who recovered and saw the cumulative number of people who have recovered are 45. In terms of districts, I told you, now there is what we call contacts. Every time you have somebody confirmed sick, he must have been interacting with other people. So those are called contacts. So when you hear us talking about contacts, those are potentially people to whom the disease has been spread by the mere fact that they have been in touch. This disease is contagious. So we follow up all those people for 21 days on a daily to ask them about their symptoms, how they're feeling. Whoever gets any symptom that is suspicious, then we take them out from wherever we are being, isolating them, test, test them, and then take them to a treatment center. So for a country to say it is successful in managing the epidemic, all the new cases must be coming from the contacts. And all the contacts must be followed up 100%. And there should be no new case found outside our contact list. And there should be no health worker falling sick as a result of infection by looking after other people. Then there we are sure we have brought the epidemic to its knees. But you see that cumulatively, we have infected 18 health workers during the time of duty of call. So these are the people we say require uh, to have a risk allowance. But some of them got the infection as part of the community. This map is so crowded, but it shows the location of the districts. And you see in red is the number of districts where we had contacts and cases confirmed, and the numbers continue to increase. Finally, before we come to the personal actions that you need to take, just to highlight what we are doing as a Minister of Health, you need to be assured that we are doing what it takes to keep the rest of the community and the country safe. How do we do that? Ministry of Health officials in conjunction with the Ministry of Education and Kampala City authorities have visited the schools where cases were within Kampala. We've had a chance to talk with the parents, the teachers, and the learners. We've condoned off and sent home all the children who were classmates to the five students who were observed in the different three schools. And all these children are being followed up at home with our contact tracers. Every division in Kampala has about 100 contact tracers or epidemiologists doing that follow-up. So we have offered standard operating guidelines to schools in terms of following up, but we shall allow all the students who are contacts to do their PLEs if they are final exams. Special arrangements will be made. Because remember, these are children who are coming out from COVID lockdown. We lost two years of education. We can't afford not to have them do the exams. So contact tracing is very important. That's why majority of our effort is put on contact tracing. So we call upon the communities to come and tell us information, appropriate and real uh, information. The first cases we had in Kampala was a patient who came changing his names. He left 
Mobende, came to Luero, came to Chirudu, but at all those places he kept changing his names. Whereas he was on our contact list and we knew that we had his identities, he kept changing his name so it was difficult to track him. However, we were able to track him because of the telephone calls he was making to the same people who were part of the contact list we had back in Mobende. So we'll need to employ technology if people are not using uh, to give us the right names. Uh, or all the details for us to prevent the spread. Also, based on what we are observing is that people believed Ebola was being caused by witchcraft. So many of them went to traditional healers. So we've had a chance to teach all traditional healers and share with them measures of how to control Ebola. We've stopped and locked up all people who are practicing traditional healing and bath tenor, bath, traditional bath attendance or skilled birth attendants in the community to spread the, stop the spread of disease. So they are on board to help us train and teach their colleagues. So we have also set up Ebola treatment units in the country. This is for the comfort of those who want to know. We have treatment centers in Madudu, that is Mubende. We are setting up a treatment center in Kassanda, in one of the hotspots now. We have set up two treatment centers one which is the Entebbe Regional Referral, which you already knew as having been a center for treating of COVID, but now we've turned it for Ebola, and then we are constructing a treatment center in one of the fields in Mulago. But also in Mulago, near the former National Drug Authority compound, we have a 120-bed uh, isolation center, which will soon turn into a treatment center. So that isolation of contacts is done elsewhere. But currently we have over, in fact, full board of the whole people we've known in Kampala's contacts are being isolated there. The other cardinal way for us to be able to manage the outbreak is to screen truck drivers who are going in and out of Mubende and Kassanda. They had refused to listen to the directive. When they go in, they have people sleep in their trucks, interact with the community, and they are driving back their illnesses. We are lucky that we are able to catch about three truck drivers who were found sick before they could drive out of the district because we they are allowed to travel to carry cover, so they are a risk to the rest of the country. So risk communication and, and uh, community engagement is one of the avenues that we shall be able to interact with all people on the local community and we shall reach people through communication on media, on radio, and their social media platforms so that people get the right information and know who to call. In fact, before I finish the call, you will allow me to share with you some telephone numbers that you can call in case you have an emergency so that you don't feel stuck. I think uh, that's enough information. I would have given you some details of Kampala and I'm happy to tell you stories, but now I want to listen to you and hear your concerns and answer questions. Thank you and over to you, uh, our moderators. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniel, for this um, wonderful presentation. Quite detailed, giving us an overview of our country status and the great work that the medical team is doing uh, together with the ministry, sorry, with the government and the partners who are partnering with the government to make sure that uh, we control the sporadic spread of uh, this epidemic. Um, I would like to invite anybody online to write their questions. If you have any pertaining to the presentation or anything that could be outside, but concerning Ebola, Ebola spread in the country. Anyone with a question, you can raise your hand or you can write in the texts for Dr. Daniel to respond. Any questions? Any comments? I think maybe you need to make them uh, panelists if they are going to be able, they need to be promoted to be able to ask. Um, yeah, there's a hand, there's a, there's a hand. 
Yes. Um, I heard something and I wanted the doctor to maybe dispel or confirm whether it's true. But uh, somebody was telling me, uh, this was, you know, random talk with somebody, a client, that uh, Ebola cannot, by the time somebody is at a, at a, at the stage of uh, spreading the disease, is actually too sick to move. So he'll probably be at home uh, or indisposed in some hospital and not able to actually come in a public area, uh, maybe to a workplace to, to spread the disease. Uh, is that something you can uh, confirm? That somebody to be able to transmit Ebola or to get to the stage where they can spread it uh, would not be a, would not be uh, mobile, freely mobile, and that means that uh, it it puts more of health workers at risk than um, the you know regular people maybe working in the offices. Thank you. Do I take that one, Helen, and then we continue, or as you wait for others? Yes, please take it on. We still have some other two here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. John Katende. To some extent, that information is closer to the truth. Not everybody who is sick will be unable to walk or move. But from all the infections we've seen, the people must come in contact with actually somebody already noted to be sick and seeking care. So true all the infections are currently seen as part of homely, home transmissions, people in the same house, okay, and people in the healthcare facility. That reinforces what you've just said. Whereas there is a doctor who moved from Bunyangabo, took a taxi to Fort Porto, took a border border into the hospital before he got all the major signs, we've not been able to find any infection along his trail. So as long as you do not have signs and symptoms of sickness and illness, we have not been able to demonstrate that you are able to transmit or infect other people. So that has helped us to confirm your suspicion that actually is critically or already sick people who are transmitting. The other way we could look at it is that in a school, in a school where the five students were, all their classmates are in quarantine. But because the, the three students never went to school on the day they felt ill, we have not seen any infections in the school. I'm building this to confirm to you that as long as somebody has not gotten any overt clinical signs, they do not infect others. So that's the chance for us to control this disease. Um, doctor, we have some other three questions here, uh, very interesting ones, and I would like to read them together for reasons that they sort of relate. So it's, thank you, Dr. Daniel. This is from Lillian Accord. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. How do we go about handling this at workplaces? We did vaccinate our staff in those areas. Would it be proper then to extend the vaccination to other staff in the districts of Wakiso and Kampala? Then another related question is, is asking Dr. Daniel, thank you. Can you share about Ebola vaccination? Okay. Um, unfortunately, the strain called Ebola Sudan has no vaccine approved. There is a Ebola Zail which has a vaccine, but for Ebola Sudan, there is no vaccine. So whereas the people in West Africa benefited from research and the development of vaccines, so the outbreak gave it an opportunity for them to come to speed, we do not have any vaccine. However, there are three vaccine candidates, and we call it vaccine candidates. People will be doing trials or studies on those who offer to take the vaccine in Uganda. What we shall extend the protocols and the study design are being finalized in my country, which is Uganda, 
I think I, I speak a lot to people who are not in my country, um, is that we will vaccinate people who are contacts, what we call ring vaccination. When you become a contact, then you are offered a chance to be vaccinated. Or otherwise, for emergency use, we shall leave the vaccination to health workers. In terms of other treatments, we have monoclonal antibodies. These are only available in the United States, but they have offered to give us some so that we are able to vaccinate those who are critically ill. You know, we've had 18 health workers who fell ill. Those who are on duty uh, have been offered some of these high level experimental medicines and they have seen quick recoveries. However, we lost the first doctor who did an operation on a patient because the patient was bleeding. He thought was opening him up to stop a bleeding internally. It only turned out that this patient had Ebola. That was at the start of the epidemic in Mubende. We tell you these stories because so that you may track the spread of the disease to the health workers. That same patient had a cardiac arrest on table. So all the doctors, the anarchists jumped on him to resuscitate only to get themselves infected. Of that cohort of uh, eight health workers, we lost two and the six are alive and discharged. We will also have another antiretroviral drug which will be used during this outbreak. And that drug was developed primarily to help in alleviating symptoms and treatment of HIV, but it has been repurposed. It was also used for COVID now. It's being approved for use for Ebola. We shall have some doses, over a thousand doses in the country, I think, uh, which will be available for use. Thank you. I'm yes, ready Dr. Bell, this. there was an additional question on how do we go about handling uh, this at the places of work outside. I think you've spoken more about uh, protection at the place of uh, the health center. How do we go about this at our places of work? Uh, thank you very much. The places of work, because we expect for you to be able to have a temperature gun to screen everybody coming in for temperature, to talk to your staff almost on a weekly, if you feel unwell, don't come to office. If you feel sick, don't force yourself to come to office. Stay home. If you had contact with a loved one who was confirmed with Ebola or suspected with Ebola, report yourself to the health workers in the private sector or call the numbers that you may be properly assessed. Don't be a risk to your workmates. They love you so much. Put sanitizer, put water, put information at the workplace that will keep the rest of you safe, the rest of us. If those who are sick stay home, and I'm not saying that you can be lazy by trying to say I'm sick because some of you, that will catch up with you. But if you're genuinely unwell, you're having a fever, you have a temperature, please don't come to mix with the rest of the people. It's both for you and your family. It will do you good. So workplace is IPC SPOPs insisting on having people's temperature monitored, having the sanitizers, people using water, people not traveling where they need to do. If you go out dancing in the night and you are in touch with um, unusual people who are sick, I hope they're not going to dance or either in the gym or you play Ludo. That would be so sad. In Cassandra, boys were playing. They have a Ludo club and pool club. All of them, six of them fell sick because one of them had a border border and he was taking a patient all around the clinics. And he came back and infected his Ludo class people or Ludo club people. But the government had closed down all this, but because of non-compliance, we've seen a spike of cases in Cassandra over nine cases in a single day. There's also a group which exhumed the body because we had not followed the, the burial team, had not followed the strict religious Islam practices of how they wash a body and bury it. Five people went and exhumed the body, washed it and reburied it. Others were saying they had taken out body organs. They found the body organs were not taken out. There was no cut on their abdomen. But all the five fell sick, three have so far died in just five days. So what we believe and what we want to practice 
and how we comply with the information is so important at this time of the epidemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Our time is well spent. We still had a few other questions, um, but just, just to conclude with this, um, are there more intentions of closing down from this, the way you see the rate? Um, because somebody's asking from Ginger, they were organizing an event. Is that still a possibility to close out Kampala for this reason? Uh, just as we close, because our time is well spent, it will be our last, last, last question. Thank you all for attending. Uh, doctor, over to you. Um, I cannot speak on how quickly or how soon movement will be restricted in Kampala. But should we get an explosion of cases in places which are highly densely populated, that will be the option going forward. We we'll rather inconvenience ourselves now and prevent the country from seeing what happened in West Africa. There is a lot of free movement in the country today, especially with border borders. They go everywhere at a fast pace. Even in one night, they can spread the disease all over. So that is a possibility. Should there be places which we should cancel and say we should cancel functions? No, the country does not have any restricted movement at the moment. So don't cancel functions until government gives overarching guidance. Let's not overreact. But if you are going to have gatherings, have IPC, temperature guns, water, and insist whoever is feeling unwell, do not come to the meeting or to the function. I think that will keep us a little sane and continue to monitor the message we are giving out. So in a nutshell, we are not in a lockdown. We don't have restricted movement apart from uh, the places which we are used and all sanitizers and hand washing, including soap and jig can work as well. So let's manage. Schools should continue being open for people to do their exams. We just have to keep the SOPs. The risk is there, but it's manageable. It's a measured risk. Thank you There's so much. a critical question. There are some people fear contracting EVD from isolation center. First mm -hmm. of all, why will they be in isolation center? So what are they fearing? By the time we take you to an isolation center, it means you've already been a contact. Now, if you say you are fearing to contracting a disease when you've already been a contact, I don't understand that double contradiction because we put you out because you've already been a contact. But when we put them in isolation center, we tell them not to mix. Everybody should keep to themselves because some people in the isolation center turn out to be negative and they're sent home. Others are actually contacts we've kept in isolation. They turn out to be positive and we take them to treatment center. So the fear is real, but you are already in a precarious condition if we are to take you to an isolation center. Don't run away from being taken from isolation center because you will die in the community and it will be too late. You will have infected your loved ones who come to look after you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Daniel Jarainze for this um, uh, presentation and an eye-opening about the country status, the efforts of the government and what we have to stay cautioned for. I would like to thank everybody who joined this call. We look forward to another call yet with you and another update. I'd like to bring this to a close and uh, with appreciation from all, uh, from Martha who helped us coordinate on the side of the ministry. Thank you so very much. Have a great day.